like I mentioned at the beginning, we're continuing our sermon series called Hard Truth. And the past couple weeks, we've looked at hard sayings of Jesus. This week, we're looking at a lesson from the epistle, from the, the letter that James wrote. And really, the whole book of James is one hard saying. It's, it's really hard for us to understand. He speaks some hard truth to us in the book of James. And we're going to read from James chapter 2. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a, golden, a gold ring and fine, clo fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there, sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has God not chosen has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him but you have dishonored the poor is it not the rich who are exploiting you are are they not the ones who are dragging you into court are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong if you really keep the royal law found in scripture love your neighbor as yourself you are doing right but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is God's word. Did you know that it only takes seven seconds for someone to form a first impression of you? There's actually a lot of research out there about this. It takes seven seconds for someone to form a first impression of you, but it starts within the first tenth of a second that someone sees you. They see you and they automatically start to, to make judgments about you. The research says that, that if you're smiling and friendly looking, they'll be more likely to trust you. It says if you're well dressed, they'll think you're smarter and more educated or more successful than someone who is not well dressed. And so we, we gather all these pieces of information when we meet somebody. We gather all of this, and it forms our first impression. And those first impressions, they matter, right? Because they stick around for a long time. There's the old saying that you never get a second chance to make a first impression. So this is why we spend so much time getting ready in the morning. This is why you do your hair and your makeup before you go out. This is why you dress up for a job interview. Because first impressions matter. And they determine how people are going to treat you. And most of the time, that's fine. But what James talks about here in, in chapter 2 of his letter, James talks about when first impressions go too far. He talks about when first impressions become the basis for showing favoritism. He gives this hypothetical scenario at the beginning of the lesson. You heard it in the first few verses. He gives this scenario where two people come into a church's meeting or a church's worship service. Two people come in, one of them rich and the other one poor. And in this scenario, he says, the, the congregation goes over to the rich person and says, here, take the best seat in the house. Here's the coffee. Bathrooms are over there. You want me to go get you a worship folder? And then the poor person comes in and they say, yeah, you can stand in the back over there, sit on the floor. We don't really care. You can see them judging these people, right, just by how they look. They're immediately judging and deciding who's worth their time and who's not. And we do this all the time, right? I saw this study, uh, this article about NFL quarterbacks. It was kind of interesting. They said that almost every NFL quarterback has above average facial symmetry which is a scientific measure of attractiveness, I guess. And so what they said is their hypothesis in this about why this happens, why almost every NFL quarterback has above average facial symmetry, they said that what happens is in youth football, 
when every kid is, is the same height and the same size, when they've all got about the same skills, none of them have really played football before, they said that the coach picks the best looking kid to be the quarterback. And so from little on, these kids have been groomed for this position of leadership simply because they have better facial symmetry than the other kids on their team. It's kind of interesting, right? And there's more research to back this up. They say that that attractiveness is a key key, uh, factor in whether or not you're going to get a position of leadership or not. People are more likely to choose someone who's more attractive for a position of leadership. See, I don't, I don't think I really need to convince you that this happens. I think you take a look around at the world and you know that this happens, right? You know that we judge people based on their appearances. But what I think I might have to convince you of is, is what James also thought he might have to convince you of, that this is a big deal, that it can be incredibly harmful to people. I mean, why do you think he spends 13 verses on the subject of favoritism? James is not a long book, and yet he spends 13 verses on this topic. He pulls out all the rhetorical stops. He, he goes as far as, saying that, as, as far as saying that showing favoritism is just as sinful as adultery and murder. James wants you, wants you to see that this is a big deal. So let me give you one piece of research to back up what James is, is saying here. This is the last, the last one, I promise. I just got a little carried away on all this first impression stuff. Let me give you one more piece of research to back this up. They did a study where they did brain scans of people who were meeting each other for the first time, and they studied what happened in their brains during those seven seconds that they were making the first impression of other people. And what happened was that the parts of their brain that normally engage during interactions or conversations with other people did not light up when they were meeting someone for the first time. Instead, the parts of the brain that were activated were the parts that are responsible for assigning prices to objects. And so it's, this, is, this is how I picture it. It's like that game on the Price is Right where you have to guess the, the price of a grocery store item. That's what's going on in our brains when we meet somebody. We're not seeing them for their personality or for who they are. We're not even seeing them as a person at all. We're seeing as, them as an object with a price tag. Just think about what that does to our society, what it has done to our society. Or you really don't even have to think about it that much because James tells you. He tells you what it did to the society back then. He said, this sends a message. If you treat rich people better than poor people, it sends a message that that the rich can do whatever they want. He says, aren't the rich the ones dragging you into court? This is talked about in 1 Corinthians too, that, that rich people in those days would drag poor people into court and sue them for all they were worth and then force them into slavery. This is what was going on back in those days. It sends a message that the strong can prey on the weak. And this this happens in our society too, right? The strong preying on the weak, and it doesn't just happen with money. Just anyone who's been to a high school knows this, right? The strong preying on the weak. It it can happen with anything you choose as your basis for judgment. It can happen with, with looks or athleticism or intelligence or education. It can happen with any of these things where the strong prey on the weak. And it, it, it creates this cycle where everyone is judged and then the people who are judged go off and judge other people. And it creates this vicious cycle where the people at the bottom of the ladder, so to speak, have no way out, where they feel powerless against the people, the stronger people who are preying on them. And it leads to these feelings of insignificance and self-loathing. It leads to feelings of depression and anxiety. Sometimes it even leads to suicide. You see now why James singles out this sin. You see how big of a deal it really is. So so why do we still do it? What what possesses us to to, to make these snap judgments of people? Well, one reason, that, one reason is, is protection, right? Sometimes we actually do need to make these snap judgments. If you're alone in a dark parking lot, you need to make a snap judgment when you see someone walking toward you. You need to know if they pose a threat to you or not, right? We use these judgments to protect ourselves. 
but we also use them to protect ourselves in a different way, right? We protect ourselves from our own insecurities because we've been judged by other people and we don't like the way that we stack up when we are judged by other people. And so we, we choose to judge others and we use whatever standard is going to make us look best in comparison to them. And so it creates this cycle where people who have been judged mercilessly judge other people without mercy. It leads to this vicious cycle where, where there is no mercy, where all there is is judgment. It might not seem like a big deal at first, but James says that it is because it, it hurts people. It leads to all kinds of problems in our relationships with other human beings, and it leads to problems in our relationship with God. That's the next thing he says. He says that, that we might think that, that in comparison to things like murder or adultery, the, the big sins, that showing favoritism is, is kind of small, insignificant in comparison to them. But James says showing favoritism is a failure to keep the royal law the law that is the king of all the other laws, the law that, that Jesus said was second only to loving God with all your heart and your soul and your mind, the law that we still refer to as the golden rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, if you are showing favoritism, you're not loving your neighbor as yourself. He says, even if you love your neighbor in every conceivable way besides this, you've still fallen short of keeping God's law because he says whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. See, God's standard for us is 100% perfection. So if you love your neighbor 99% of the way or if you love them 1% of the way, it doesn't matter. You're still not at 100. That's what James is saying here. Whoever stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. But the biggest reason, besides the fact that it hurts our relationship with other people, besides the fact that it hurts our relationship with God, the biggest reason James has for forbidding favoritism is this. Favoritism is simply incompatible with the message of the gospel. Think about it. The Bible tells us that God doesn't need seven seconds to determine whether we have anything to offer him. The Bible, or God doesn't need seven seconds to determine if we've kept his law perfectly or not. If, if we're enough for him, if we, have, if we have done everything that he requires of us, he doesn't need seven seconds to determine that. He knows. We haven't. We've all stumbled at, it, at many more than one point. And yet, the judgment that we think we have coming to us, the judgment that is, that is swift and fierce and unavoidable, the judgment that we deserve for our sin is not what we get. James says God's mercy triumphs over judgment. See, the, the picture behind that word, uh, the, the word triumph, is of two gladiators ent entering a ring together. So in one corner, you've got the undisputed champion of the world, judgment. And in the other corner, you've got mercy. And James says when those two step in the ring together, mercy ends up standing with his foot on the neck of judgment. And that's not because God's judgment is weak. It's not because God is a lenient judge who just shoots you a wink and says, I'll let it slide this time. It's because God took out the judgment that was deserved. He took it all out. He absorbed it into himself by sending his son to pay the price for our sin, sending his son to, to suffer the pain of hell on the cross as he suffered separation from God by sending his son to die so that we could live, to be punished and judged so that we could receive mercy. And that carries through to, to how God views us in our lives. That carries through to the way that God looks at you because now when he looks at you, he doesn't see you as a, as a favorite, playing, unmerciful sinner who deserves nothing but his wrath and punishment. He sees the perfect impartiality of Jesus who lived as your substitute and signed your name on his sinless life. So now when God looks at you, it doesn't take him even a tenth of a second to determine your value because your value doesn't come from the way you look. It doesn't come from, 
It doesn't come from the clothes on your back or the money on your wallet or the degree on your wall. Your value comes from what God paid for you. That's how value works, right? It's what someone's willing to pay for something. God paid the infinitely valuable life of his own son for you. And that means that you have infinite value in his sight. When you realize that, when you realize that you've been shown that kind of mercy, it sets you free. It sets you free from that cycle of judgment. From, it sets you free from worrying what other people think about you and how they judge you. It sets you free to show mercy to other people in your life. Because when you realize the value that's been placed on you by Jesus' death on the cross, you realize, and you realize that he didn't just die for you, but, but for the whole world. He didn't just die for the, for the rich and the powerful, for the elite, for the, for the best in, in the world. He died for the entire world. Then you realize that it doesn't take you even a tenth of a second, to determine people's value either. Everyone has the same value. God's mercy is an incredible barrier breaker. It's the great equalizer. We're all sinners, but we're all saved by Jesus. And so that means that everyone you come into contact with is a chance for you to show God's mercy. It doesn't matter whether they live under a bridge or in a River Oaks mansion. Everyone has the same value in God's eyes. Everyone is a person that Jesus died for. And so when you know that, when you're reminded of that mercy, it sets you free to unleash God's mercy on the world, to unleash God's mercy that triumphs over judgment. And that starts right here in the church. That's what James uses as his example, right? He's talking about when two people come into a church gathering. So as, I, as we close today, I want you to think about this. What do you think it looks like for a church to be a place where mercy triumphs over judgment? I think, I think that kind of a church would be a place where people didn't have to be afraid to open up to others about their sins and their struggles. I think it would be a place where you don't have to, to put on a happy face and fake it when, when you're struggling with depression or anxiety. I think it would be a place where you don't have to be afraid to be honest and vulnerable with people because you know that what you're going to receive from them is mercy, not judgment. I think it would, it would be a place that would be actively at, the, at work in the community a place that would be actively at work in the community to show mercy to people our society has passed judgment on. I think it would be a place where, where doubts would be welcomed, where they would be discussed, where questions about faith would be answered. A place where you don't have to have it all together, where you don't have to have it all figured out. A place where you can come when you're financially or physically in need and find help. I think that's what it would look like to be a place where mercy triumphs over judgment. And obviously that, that sounds unrealistic, right? It sounds utopian even. And it's true that we're never going to fully realize, perfectly realize that vision until we get to heaven. But that's God's vision for the church. God's vision for us, our vision as a church is to be a place where mercy triumphs over judgment. A place where anyone can come and be welcomed. It, our vision is to be a place that unleashes the barrier-breaking mercy of God on the world. And to do that, the only way we can do that is to keep coming here, to gather around God's word and his sacraments, because it's there that we're reminded that we're sinners who are in every way deserving of God's judgment, and yet we've been shown incredible mercy through Christ. When we're reminded of that, when we know God's mercy, then we can go out and show God's mercy to the world. We can show this world that's so, fil so filled with judgment, a mercy that triumphs over judgment. Amen.